we're really glad we're really glad to be able to restart the uh, uh, Werner and Joan Sampson uh, visiting lectureship uh, with a very impressive uh, uh, speaker today, Dr. Jim Fang from uh, the University of Utah. Uh, Jim uh, got his BA and MD from Duke, uh, followed by residency and then cardiova cardiovascular training, including heart failure uh, training at the Brigham. Uh, he then joined the Harvard faculty, uh, moving to then moving to Case Western in 2008. Since 2013, uh, when he uh, completed his Western migration here at the University of Utah, uh, where he's the Hartman Endowed Professor or Hartman Endowed Chair, uh, Chief of the Chief of the Cardiovascular Division and Executive Director of the Cardiovascular Service Line, uh, he's won numerous teaching awards at every uh, stop, uh, and uh, received a Master Lenec Master Clinician Award from the American Heart Association. His CV lists 143 peer-reviewed publications. He's uh, co-authored 11 scientific statements and 32 reviews, uh, and really is a, a leading force in the field of heart failure cardiology. Uh, so very pleased to have uh, Jim here today uh, to uh, give the uh, Samson lecture. Well, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Rob, for inviting me. As I was uh, talking earlier, I only wish I could be there in person. So. Let me share my screen uh, and make sure we can pull up my talk. Uh, Kevin, can you see everything here? Yeah, Jim, looks great. Okay, fantastic. Well, <clears throat> uh, what I hope to do today is to perhaps give you um, a different perspective and uh, <laughs> arguably my perspective on this condition, HEFPEF, which has been you know, quite the dilemma for all of us in cardiovascular medicine and frankly, in medicine in general. So here are my uh, disclosures. I think importantly, I will be talking um, about the use of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors um, as well as uh, Secupatrol Valsartan and I have had roles in clinical trials of uh, both of these compounds. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the epidemiology here. This is pretty familiar to everybody uh, on the call. There's no doubt that uh, it appears to be increasing in prevalence. It accounts for at least 50% of the patients that we see in the hospital with acute decompensate or heart failure. There's a uh, pretty impressive association with uh, aging that all of us recognize as well. Importantly, diagnosis is not sometimes as straightforward as you might think, which I do think challenges sometimes interpretation of the clinical trials as they relate to clinical practice. But that has uh, improved, I believe, um, over the past uh, several uh, years. And I think we also need to uh, recognize the morbidity and mortality of this syndrome. I'll never forget when I was uh, a house officer in 1988 at Hopkins, I was told that uh, diastolic heart failure never killed anybody. Um, and I think we've um, certainly come a long way since then. So it hasn't that uh, it hasn't been um, a problem of not trying. <laughs> this is a summary slide um, I made a few years ago, looking at um, the clinical trials in this space over the past 20 years, and multiple approaches have been taken with multiple compounds. You can see the color coding reflecting the class of therapy. And of course, there have been a number of newer trials. Uh, these are the monikers given to these trials, testing, uh, uh, again, a variety of uh, pharmacologic interventions. And with uh, perhaps a few notable exceptions that I'll be getting to near the end, they continue um, to be neutral. Here's the latest attempt that many of you probably heard about last week. And this was the reduced lap hf trial which was trying to take a mechanical approach uh, to this uh, sometimes um, hemodynamically uh, problematic situation uh, in which a uh, placement of a, essentially an ASD as a pop-off valve um, was used to try to decompress the left atrium uh, to improve um, functional and uh, clinical outcomes. But unfortunately, and perhaps many of us might say as predictable, was neutral. And um, those of us in the space have uh, all tried to put our heads together and, and come up with reasonable 
suggestions for clinicians to address this problem. But as you can see, uh, we continue to struggle. Um, if I would ask you to look at this table from the guidelines from 2017. They will be updated, by the way, in April. And I really want you to pay attention not only to the level of evidence in column two, which is primarily by consensus, but you'll see on the far right that the uh, recommendations were simply carried over from a few years prior. There were a couple of exceptions to this. Um, the use of uh, MRAs was given a 2B recommendation, which is many people on the call recognize as a pretty soft recommendation. And then, of course, noting that nitrates, which are often commonly used in this condition, really provide no benefit and really are discouraged. Also, a blood pressure goal was um, added uh, in light of the SPRINT trial data. And, <clears throat> but again, these I don't think were major advances uh, in therapeutics. So, you know, it really begs the question, why do we continue to fail? Uh, are we studying the wrong patients? That often comes up, certainly in the early trials. So this was uh, debated. Um, have we really been barking up um, the wrong uh, interventions? A neurohormonal activation has been a cornerstone of heart failure management and uh, targetable, but perhaps uh, I think we've learned that it's uh, perhaps uh, the wrong way to go. Have we looked at the wrong endpoints at the end of the day? You know, um, we have to recognize the importance of all-cause mortality, but also the importance of quality of life endpoints. Um, and I think this is also um, a reasonable point to make in clinical trials. But then finally, perhaps we've been thinking about the wrong target. Uh, we are cardiologists, and it is called heart failure at the end of the day. But perhaps uh, we've uh, somewhat missed the boat. Well, you know, almost 10 years ago now, Sanjeev Shah uh, published this paper that really, I think, uh, propelled us into the current paradigm of HEFPEF, that this is a uh, heterogeneous condition and using uh, machine learning techniques and a cohort of uh, deeply phenotyped uh, patients at Northwestern, almost 600 patients, he was able to segregate them into a number of, of phenotypes. Um, all of which had specific characteristics and associated with <clears throat> different uh, uh, clinical outcomes. And this has been taken up by a number of investigators. This is just one effort. This is by Tom Hamp when he was at Penn. He's now with us here at Utah, where in collaboration uh, with Julio Chirinos and Tom Coppola using the Penn Heart Study and the TopCat data sets, looked at the specific subgroups of uh, HFPEF patients with diabetes and suggested that um, an apolipoprotein, specifically APOM, perhaps was a targetable um, pathogenic mechanism uh, that was specifically involved in the HFPEF phenotype um, of diabetes. But I, as a clinician, tend to be more of a lumper than a splitter. And I love this, um, I love this uh, photograph of uh, Robin Williams um, approaching the very famous uh, sculpture, The Thinker, <laughs> with perhaps a different perspective about what he's, what he's doing. And uh, I thought the syndrome of Hefpef, you know, uh, could be addressed from a different perspective. And this was really brought to light to me personally um, from an analysis we did from the Penn Heart Study a number of years ago where we looked at the outcomes of patients who had recovered their ejection fraction. There are many monikers for this. One is uh, heart failure with improved ejection fraction, heart failure with better ejection fraction. But when we looked at the outcomes of these patients relative to patients with HEF-PEF or HEF-REF, we found that these patients also ended up in the hospital with events. And <clears throat> I kept asking myself, well, why were they continuing to have events if uh, the ejection fraction had recovered and arguably stroke volume had recovered and therefore cardiac output uh, had recovered. What was the stimulus to salt and water retention? And again, in the spirit of being a lumper, I don't think anybody would debate the primacy of congestion to the diagnosis. Every single clinical trial of uh, modern day um, HEFPEF uh, therapeutics Re requires some evidence of congestion, whether it's at the bedside from signs and symptoms or laboratory. 
um, including an elevated natriuretic peptide. I took this slide from the TopCat trial. We were an active participant in TopCat, which, as you recall, was a trial of um, spironolactone for the management of patients with ejection fractions of greater than 45% in congestion. So what I would like to propose is instead of embracing the heterogeneity, let's go back to some <laughs> homogeneous concepts. First of all, it really, uh, this condition largely remains unexplained. Despite multiple observations suggesting heterogeneity, and I didn't even go over the multiple um, mechanistic pathways that people have described, including hemodynamic um, insights, we clinically really define it by the consequences of volume overload, ultimately heart failure hospitalizations. All of us have been in clinic with the shorter breath patient, but until the patient requires a diuretic or gets hospitalized for volume overload, do we really not strongly consider the diagnosis of heart failure? Yet, despite this clear clinical observation, the fundamental cause of sodium and fluid overload remains unexplored. Now, this is the traditional paradigm for heart failure, and the central role of neurohormonal activation is hard to debate. There is some, uh, at least in HEF-REF, and heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, there's clearly some incident myocardial injury that results in a fall on LV and cardiovascular performance. This, of course, activates the renin-angiotensin pathways as well as the adrenergic pathways and others as well, which ultimately uh, results in not only further left ventricular remodeling and dysfunction, but frankly, sodium and fluid avidity, and um, of course leads to symptomatic uh, dyspnea and heart failure hospitalization. Well. <clears throat> If uh, this is true in half path, we should be able to document these three issues. We should be able to, number one, find a cardiovascular stimulus for the neurohormonal activation. Two, we should be able to document neurohormonal activation. And then, of course, number three, we should be able to antagonize these pathways and improve outcomes. So how true is this in half path? Well, <clears throat> um, a number of hemodynamic studies, uh, invasive hemodynamic studies, have done in half path. And if you look at any of these studies, short of the patient with a restrictive cardiomyopathy, such as amyloid, it's very difficult to prove that these patients uh, are low cardiac output or um, have an inappropriately low SVR. Um, people have talked about the obesity um, phenotype as a uh, high output syndrome. But again, if you're looking at low output as being the stimulus for salt and water tension, very difficult to see it. And this work from Barry Borlaug, if you look at the last uh, row, uh, you'll notice the cardiac index there is the same across um, both um, the hypertensive controls, the half of patients, um, and the other controls. And if you look at the SVRI, there really are no differences um, seen there in the third row. So number two, we should be able to document neurohormonal activation. Well, there are not a lot of data sets out there to look at. This is from the SOLVE data set. John McMurray did this a number of years ago. Uh, what you see on the left are plasma norepinephrine levels. On the right, you see plasma renin activity. The first bar is controls. Uh, the second bar are the HEF-PEF patients, and the last bar are the HEF-REF patients. And yeah, you can see neurohormonal activation of the uh, adrenergic nervous system uh, in HEF-REF, but I would argue that certainly that middle bar, that clear bar, certainly um, is not impressively different than controls. And then finally, we should be able to find evidence that antagonizing either the adrenergic nervous system or the renin-angiotensin systems should improve outcomes. Now, there have been no large-scale beta blocker trials that are randomized placebo-controlled in this space. The best we really have are observational data. This is data from the Swedish heart failure cohort from Lars Lund. And if you just really concentrate on the matched uh, two um, Kaplan-Meier curves at the very bottom there, you can see that there really is no difference um, in outcomes in patients uh, who are treated with beta blockers with half pef In fact, many of us in clinical practice will often stop the beta blocker um, in these patients um, if exertional intolerance is one of their complaints. Well, how about antagonizing the renin angiotensin system? This is the iPreserve trial, one of the larger trials um, in the half pef space. As you recall, using the ARB herbisartan versus a placebo, 
uh, in this uh, prospective trial, there was no difference in the combined outcome of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And if you specifically look at the issue of heart failure hospitalizations, which are, again, almost overwhelmingly um, due to congestion, you can see that there was absolutely no benefit. And no matter how you split it, trying to find a subgroup within this particular trial, um, again, very difficult to find a subgroup in which antagonizing the renin-angiotensin system had an impact on heart failure hospitalizations. Again, begging the question, what is the stimulus for salt and water retention in these cohorts? And in fact, in contrast to half ref where we see antagonism of their RAS system having uh, an impact on renal function as a potential marker of benefit, in half PEF patients, you see that when we see this worsening of renal function with the introduction of this class of drugs to these patients, that it appears to actually be a marker of worse outcome. And perhaps this provides us some insight into what's going on. Perhaps the ARB is uncovering some intrinsic renal dysfunction that is driving the condition. So it really, I believe, would beg the question for us, is HEF-PEF really heart failure in the traditional sense? I borrowed this from Maggie uh, Redfield and Barry Borlaug, which compared clinical trials of HEF-PEF and HEF-REF. You see HEF-REF trials there with neurohormonal antagonism in blue and the HEF-PEF trials um, there in red. As you can see, there's a dramatic difference, and I think we all recognize this clinically and from our clinical trials. So perhaps this is really a disorder of the kidney. The kidney is, at the end of the day, perhaps driving all of this. I love this slide from uh, Bob Schreier and Bill Abraham from the New England Journal from a number of years ago that was describing um, the impact of heart failure on the kidney. And I put this up because, as you can see, all of the arrows actually point toward the kidney. <laughs> there are no arrows that point from the kidney outward. And <clears throat> I think this is a very important limitation to how we fit, think of heart failure as cardiologists and as heart failure um, experts. In fact, uh, one of our very good friends uh, wrote the chapter in Brownwald, um, arguably one of the most important textbooks in the management of heart disease. And I took this quote out of uh, the chapter just to, again, uh, amplify our biases. Uh, there, and the quote is, there is little evidence to suggest that a primary renal abnormality is responsible for excessive sodium retention and heart failure. So I do think we're sort of set up uh, to be biased against the kidney. So I'm going to try to make a case for the kidney over the next uh, 30 minutes. If sodium and fluid avidity or lack of excretion is not being driven by neurohormonal stimulation, then perhaps the kidney must be doing so inappropriately, a renal disorder or perhaps a renal cardiac disorder, so to speak. So what is the evidence that the kidney is the problem? Well, uh, I think these uh, five points, um, I think, are pretty reasonable um, pieces of circumstantial evidence. Number one, renal insufficiency is common to have PEP and associated independently with outcomes. I think all of us accept this. I'll go over a little bit of data, um, but uh, I think that's a pretty well accepted idea. Renal uh, function is inadequately characterized by measures of glomerular filtration. I think this is an important point to make as you look at data because everybody simply wants to look at the creatinine or the EGFR as a way to characterize renal function. Uh, number three, renal insufficiency can presage HEFPEF. There are a number of prospective epidemiologic studies that would suggest this. Uh, we'll go over some of that. Point number four, renal insufficiency can mediate cardiovascular dysfunction. Um, again, there's a lot of evidence for this. I'll highlight a few. Um, and then finally, I think we should also recognize the very important deleterious effect of salt and water overload in and of itself. And once it occurs, it becomes a vicious cycle um, for, the, for the systemic milieu um, of patients with uh, comorbidities and heart failure. So this idea that um, CKD is independently associated with outcomes in HEF-REF and HEF-PEF um, has been established over the course of a couple of decades. This is just one such epi epidemiologic study. You see some large data sets from Kaiser um, as well as some other healthcare systems 
And as you can see, as GFR falls, um, you can see that there's a progressive increase in uh, risk for hospitalization for heart failure, whether there is HEF-PEF in the middle column or HEF-REF in the far column. And the uh, magnitude is quite similar. So let's buy, but let's move on to this issue of assessing CKD in clinical trials and in clinical practice. And I think I want to drive home a point that we've investigated a little bit, and this is the issue of that renal function is inadequately characterized by measures of glomerular filtration. Now, certainly GFR is important, but don't forget sodium and renal uh, handling is also a function of the tubules, which we do not really assess in clinical practice. You know, in 1988, when I was an intern, we assessed renal function uh, at the bedside by BUN, creatinine, urine output, and perhaps a renal ultrasound. Uh, it is arguably uh, 30 plus years later, and how do we assess renal function uh, in clinical practice? Uh, BUN, creatinine, maybe estimated GFR, urine output, and a renal ultrasound. <laughs> so, uh, and I think that over 30 years of trying to assess renal function in our patients, we've really, I think, uh, just scratched the surface of uh, insights into renal function. So this is epidemiologic evidence that, uh, that I'm showing you here that would suggest that if you could actually assess renal function more carefully, uh, for example, using tubular biomarkers to help you, you could help segregate outcomes in a much more precise way. This is work from GCHF where you can see that those patients in whom had abnormalities in tubular interstitial biomarkers had uh, worse outcomes than those patients um, who had um, no abnormalities in, in tubular biomarkers but did have evidence of CKD. This is also driven home by some translational investigations. This is a very nice study out of Italy only are involving 10 patients, and I'll be the first one to tell you these are HEF-REF patients, but not HEF-PEF patients. But I think that the point is uh, well made here that GFR simply just does not reflect the sodium and fluid avidity in our patients. So these were a group of uh, HEF-REF patients that were sodium loaded over the course of a couple of weeks. As you can see, compared to normal controls, GFR uh, goes up because of the increase in plasma volume. Renal blood flow, of course, goes up accordingly, and there's a lowering of renal vascular resistance. But what's really interesting here that, as you can see in the very first set of uh, bar tables, that although the filtration of sodium is increased similarly in normal subjects and patients with HEF-REF because of the increase in GFR and renal plasma flow from the salt loading, what's very different is the clearance of water, the fractional excretion of sodium, and the fractional uh, excretion of potassium is um, diminished compared to controls. And this is despite the same GFR. And I think this is a very important observation that we've all seen in our clinical practices. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's always important to keep in mind that the kidney um, may be actually driving this if we're just unable in clinical practice to appreciate it. We've uh, recapitulated this work in HEF-PEF patients. Um, this is a work in progress. Um, the manuscript is in preparation, but we basically did the same thing in HEF-PEF patients. And what we found very similarly was um, no big surprise that the percentage of infused um, sodium excreted in urine over three hours um, was uh, attenuated compared to controls and in fact uh, resulted in a um, positive fluid balance. We're looking at a number of other things, but I think it speaks to the same issue. Okay, what is the evidence that um, renal insufficiency can presage FPEF? Well, there are animal models. Uh, this is one. This is a subtotal nephrectomy pig model that uh, Josh Hare uh, used in Miami to um, test the uh, intervention of uh, growth hormone um, in treating this condition. These were, this was a pig model, and they were nephrectomized by um, embolizing a portion um, of one kidney. And as you can see, um, the phenotype of HEF-PEF was um, well demonstrated 
um, through the pictures up on the left, and you can see on the right here the table that demonstrates abnormalities in renal function <coughs> uh, that are also very indicative of the clinical half path. Uh, that we see in, in practice. And if you look at these uh, hearts, there is an increase in the diastolic uh, pressure, um, changes in the uh, uh, PVR and relaxation. Well, in addition to animal models, um, in which we uh, create HFPEF by intervening in the kidney, there are prospective uh, epidemiologic data sets that would suggest the same. This is from the PREVEND registry. Uh, from the Netherlands, this is a large prospective cohort of 8,500 patients that were followed for a little bit more than a decade who had baseline, who had um, very modest amounts of urinary albumin excretion, and we'll talk a little bit later about the importance of looking for albuminuria as a very subtle marker um, of renal dysfunction in our patients that we often don't do as cardiologists, but I would uh, make a case to do so. In this prospective cohort, you can see I've highlighted for you that those patients who had abnormalities in renal function, uh, particularly the urinary albumin excretion above a certain threshold, and abnormalities of cisatin C, uh, portended the development of HFPEF over a decade, in contrast to HFREF, where that was not seen. Again, describing the importance of uh, renal insufficiency to driving the disorder. It's also important to recognize, and I think we all know this as well, is that renal insufficiency in and of itself leads to cardiovascular dysfunction. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I think this is reasonably well accepted. Um, this is work from uh, Northwestern that demonstrates that there is a uh, association between uh, worsening your renal function and abnormalities, um, structural abnormalities of the heart. You can look at left atrial reservoir function. Um, LVH, uh, left atrial size. Um, there are a number of ways to look at this. And this association, I think, is um, um, circumstantial evidence against, uh, to, supports the idea that certain renal uh, dysfunction can drive cardiovascular dysfunction. I think we also recognize the importance of um, renal dysfunction in vascular disease. Uh, clearly, um, abnormalities of the kidney drive a stiffening uh, vascular tree. On the left, you can see here that as um, EGFR uh, declines, that there's a worsening in compliance. And this is also paralleled by increases in urinary um, albumin excretion. And on the panel B, you can see the pulse wave velocity also increases as the CKD gets worse and is amplified in patients with diabetes, <clears throat> which we all know is an important risk factor um, for uh, HFPEF and CKD as well as renal insufficiency. Now, what are the mediators? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because there's a lot of potential um, compounds. There are a number of proteomic studies that have been looking at um, uh, novel um, putative markers. These are just some of the things that have been looked at in um, a number of studies. Some of them are targetable, some are less targetable in clinical practice. But the point is that there are likely a multitude of um, uh, protein mediators um, in, in patients with CKD or subtle evidence of CKD that can drive cardiovascular dysfunction. Well, finally, I think it's important to recognize that sodium and fluid overload in and of itself is a cardiovascular insult and perhaps in a vicious cycle manner perpetuates the problem. Um, this is probably best seen in clinical practice um, in the ICU in patients who've had previous cardiac surgery. I think we all recognize that the massive volume overload in the pump run produces problems uh, for um, renal and cardiovascular dysfunction uh, and function. Um, we know that uh, distending the vascular tree, venous or arterial, results in systemic inflammation, increases in oxidative stress. I think we're all comfortable that uh, the back pressure on the kidney uh, certainly impacts renal function. Um, a distended vascular tree is a stiffer vascular tree. Of course, there's hypertension as a consequence, and it's a very strong stimulus for adrenergic, uh, adrenergic stim, uh, activity. The impact of actually venous distension, I do, I do think, though, is worth highlighting. 
Uh, this is really nice work from near Ariel in New York, where what he did was take uh, normal uh, human subjects and simply created venous distension in the arm here with a blood pressure cuff, and then sampled uh, the blood um, and the endothelium uh, just using a small wire uh, in the vein, and then looked at the changes. And with this passive congestion, what they were able to demonstrate was perhaps no big surprise increase in a number of markers of inflammation, including IL-6, TNF-alpha, and endothelin, as well as angiotensin-2, as well as endothelial activation, as marked by VCAM expression. So again, just distending the venous system uh, is an incredibly strong uh, inflammatory uh, stimulus systemically. Congestion and chronic congestion in animal models also can produce glomerular sclerosis. This is a uh, rat model, um, a nephrectomized rat model given a high salt diet. And what you see in the upper left is the uh, normal, glomeruli, uh, normal glomeruli, um, the sham control with just normal saline. And you can see that the scarring um, next to it using uh, high salt uh, produces this very uh, scarred glomerulus. And this can be um, attenuated by endapamide, a diuretic. Again, demonstrating <clears throat> the importance of um, salt loading um, and, and, uh, and CKD with um, impacts on the glomerulus and renal function over time. So, <clears throat> you know, perhaps uh, we've made a reasonably strong case that HFPEF is perhaps not being driven by the heart, but it's being really driven by the kidney. So, you know, that being said, what are really the therapeutic implications for us, both uh, clinically and, I guess, from an investigation point of view? Well, obviously, controlling sodium and fluid avidity is key. That seems somewhat intuitive, but there is um, evidence to say that if you do this prophylactically, so to speak, that you can um, delay or prevent the onset of the syndrome. Of course, targeting the kidney is very important. We'll talk a little bit about this in cl from a clinical trial perspective. And then, of course, uh, the last point I'm going to make is a little bit of a commentary on cardiorenal syndrome or renal cardio syndrome, in which I try to make the case that uh, it's very difficult to say which is the first offender um, um, in a very abnormal neighborhood. Well, this is work from um, Scott Hummel at Michigan. It's a small group of patients that he published in hypertension a number of years ago who had been all admitted with uh, HFPEF and, uh, and introduced the DASH diet um, and looked at um, a number of um, surrogate markers following this uh, three-week um, DASH diet. And as we, what you can see here, that just with dietary intervention and salt restriction, you see a lowering of the blood pressure in these HFPEF patients, both in clinic uh, and at home. There is improvement in um, pulse wave velocity, suggesting improvement in vascular compliance, um, as well as evidence of uh, decreased um, oxidant stress and inflammation. We know also um, in the uh, human uh, clinical experience that managing um, volume, um, even when it's um, a bit uh, Subtle uh, can help keep people out of the hospital. This is a uh, often quoted uh, subgroup analysis from the modestly sized cardiomenist trial of 550 patients, in which 119 of them had HEF-PEF defined by an injection fraction of greater than 40%. As you can see here, that um, managing their volume status uh, before it's uh, symptomatic can keep people out of the hospital. Uh, number two um, is that if you look at some clinical trials, um, you can also see that perhaps managing uh, volume in a way that you didn't think you were actually managing volume may uh, benefit patients. So this is an analysis we did from the TopCat trial with the hypothesis that, you know, don't forget spironolactone is a diuretic. <laughs> now, it's a modest diuretic. and. I think we've all seen patients who've had significant um, naturesis with it and other patients with uh, uh, much more modest uh, levels of uh, naturesis and diuresis. 
but it does seem to impact the need for loop diuretic use. If you just concentrate on the um, graph in the lower right hand corner, you can see that those patients in red that were randomized to spironolactone really did not require an increase in their diuretic dose over time, uh, in contrast to those patients in placebo. Um, and these were all, again, to maintain a stable body weight, as you can see in the upper left hand panel. So, again, managing volume. Uh, preclinically, I think is very, uh, or um, presymptomatically, I think is really important to um, reducing incident PEF. Another, I think, reasonably powerful piece of evidence comes from the All Hat trial. Many of you will recall the All Hat trial. This is a large multicenter clinical trial, one of the largest ever done in patients um, with uh, hypertension. And there were four arms, you recall, chlorothalidone, lisinopril, amlodipine, and prazosin. The prazosin arm was discontinued early because of an increase in uh, heart failure hospitalizations. But what I wanted to point out in this uh, post hoc analysis was that it appeared to be that the diuretic, chlorothalidone, uh, in contrast to lisinopril and amlodipine, uh, impacted incident half PEF, seen in the graph on the left. In contrast, to HEF-REF, where both chlorothalidone and lisinopril attenuated incident HEF-REF compared to amlodipine. Again, this idea that, you know, uh, managing sodium and fluid uh, avidity uh, of the kidney um, in this syndrome perhaps is um, where the money is. Well, of course, um, normal kidneys uh, should handle salt and water normally, so maybe we should try to prevent or slow renal dysfunction. We explored this actually in the TopCat trial. Well, we looked at albuminuria as a very subtle um, marker of uh, renal insufficiency. And what we found um, in the TopCat trial with the use of spironolactone is that uh, spironolactone uh, did have an impact on reducing albuminuria uh, in these patients, again, speaking to perhaps its renal benefits. Uh, the effect size um, in uh, top cat, again, restricted to the Americas, that the effect was larger um, with uh, greater degrees of uh, albuminuria. Reducing albuminuria was associated with a reduction in heart failure hospitalization and all-cause mortality. And then very importantly, um, the spironolactone effect was not entirely explained by the reduction in systolic blood pressure that you see um, with spironolactone. Again, suggesting that perhaps one of the ways that uh, spironolactone and MRAs were working in this syndrome of HEFPAF was to preserve renal function. This, of course, um, has been expanded to um, the latest class of MRAs. This is the phenarinone experience. Um, there are several large trials um, of this class of MRA. These are non-steroidal, highly selective MRAs um, that have been studied in large-scale clinical trials in patients who are at very high risk for cardiovascular and renal outcomes who have baseline CKD and diabetes. These are patients with albuminuric renal insufficiency and diabetes. And in the Figaro trial, where the primary endpoint was cardiovascular, <coughs> It was quite clear that by using this class of drug that there was a reduction in um, cardiovascular endpoints and specifically the combined endpoint of cardiovascular, cardiovascular death and first heart failure hospitalization independent of the history of um, baseline heart failure and very importantly um, uh, also associated with uh, heart failure related death and the first heart failure hospitalization and <clears throat> time to first heart failure hospitalization. So this intervention um, also um, slowed the progression of renal disease, not only by EGFR slope, but by hard renal outcomes, such as a sustained fall in EGFR, uh, the need for renal transplantation, dialysis, or even renal death. And then very importantly, as I've highlighted here in the lower left, hyperkalemia, uh, obviously an issue with these agents, was relatively uh, uncommon. And we shouldn't forget other experiences. Um, the Paragon HF trial, I think everybody is familiar with this story of Sucupitrol valsartan in the management of um, FPEF. 
that uh, with a value of, with a p-value of 0 0.06 did appear to reduce the combined endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations, again driven almost entirely by the heart reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. But importantly, you should recognize that there was um, a um, there was a uh, uh, reduction in renal endpoints, albeit small and albeit post hoc. Um, and there's also been other evidence in um, HEF-PEF experiences that this class of drug does appear to attenuate the decline in renal function as assessed by EGFR. But of course, <clears throat> um, this talk wouldn't be complete without talking about some, what some people have called the perfect diuretic, and that is uh, sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitors. Now, <clears throat> um, this class of drug, as, as Dr. Brownwald, I think, wrote in a piece in the European Heart Journal, would appear to be the new statin um, of, of, of heart failure. Um, this class of drug has a multitude of effects. There's no doubt that it produces a glucosiurea and a naturesis. But there's an impact on uh, uh, myocardial metabolism, for example, uh, a ketone metabolism. A lot has been made of the sodium proton pump. Uh, and, and they're just really a, 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 a very large number of effects that are very difficult to tease out, certainly can't be done from a clinical trial. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this drug class <laughs> targets the kidney. It's hard to argue. Uh, so certainly, sodium. A glucose co-transporter is in the proximal uh, tubule and is the location for most of this um, particular co-transporter. Yes, you can see it in other organs, um, but it's predominantly in, in the kidney. And I think this speaks to the primacy of targeting the kidney in the management of not only of heart failure, but of HEFPEF. And of, of course, this was um, that this was really um, uh, solidified in the emperor preserved trial, a trial of empical flows in patients with ejection fractions of greater than 40%. We will have the delivery results, which is the use of dapical flows in NHFPEF, hopefully uh, later this year. But as people recall, in this trial of uh, patients with ejection fractions of uh, greater than 40%, an elevated um, uh, and T, pro B, and P, and abnormalities on, on echo, that it did reduce the combined endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. Um, and it did so very quickly, as you can see, the separation of the curves there. But again, we should recognize that this was uh, not driven um, by the cardiovascular death or all-cause mortality. It was really driven by heart failure hospitalization. <clears throat> you could see also that these patients were um, uh, had really only mild heart failure. The vast majority of these patients um, were on uh, diuretics and had uh, an NT pro BMP of 1,000 um, with a GFR of 60, so very comparable perhaps to some of our patients in clinical practice, but many of our patients are much more symptomatic than this, and it still uh, uh, hasn't been tested in more advanced um, HEFPEF. Um, but those studies uh, are likely um, underway. So <clears throat> I do think, though, it's worth highlighting the fact that if you accept that sacupagil valsartan and perhaps the SGL2 2 inhibitors are foundational for the management of PEF, I think we should also recognize that their impact is limited to heart failure hospitalization. This is a... Um, piece written by Milton Packer, uh, Fazad uh, um, Zanad, as well as Stefan Anker in uh, Circulation that explores the impact of these two classes of drugs on the clinical outcomes. And as you can see, if you look at cardiovascular death in the lower right-hand panel, there really is no impact independent of the ejection fraction in these clinical trials where all the benefit is, is really in the upper right-hand panel, time to first hospitalization, or in the lower left-hand panel, total first and recurrent uh, hospitalizations. And so they appear to be impacting congestion, since that is the most common cause of heart failure hospitalizations. A few final comments about therapeutic implications. 
again, one of the reasons I did not become a nephrologist was because at the time there were no renal specific, uh, arguably quote unquote renal specific drugs. Um, but I think that of course has changed as I've illustrated in the past few minutes. I do think though that um, perhaps the paradigm shift is that instead of thinking about the heart or even the kidney specifically, we should be thinking about what I like to call the neighborhood or the milieu. It's important to recognize that I think whether you call it cardio, renal cardio syndrome or cardio renal syndrome, that the, the point is that both of these organs uh, live in a systemic environment um, that uh, is driven by a multitude of uh, factors, including comorbidities, genetic influences, and even gender related uh, issues. And that these two organs communicate with each other in a number of ways, vascular, bloodborne, and autonomic. But the fact of the matter is, you know, it's very difficult sometimes in, in clinical practice to know which came first, the renal insufficiency or the heart dysfunction. And you might argue, does it really even matter? Obviously, when patients have sh cardiogenic shock and there's renal insufficiency as a consequence of that, that's pretty straightforward as renal uh, dysfunction uh, from uh, cardiac dysfunction. And likewise, when you have a patient on dialysis and you don't dialyze them and <laughs> they come in fluid overloaded, that's, I think, pretty easy to appreciate. That's a uh, renally uh, driven situation. But most of our patients, frankly, are somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> so the issue of addressing the milieu um, is perhaps where the action is, and you can argue this is where both sacubitril valsartan and sodium glucose cotransporter type 2 inhibitors are really making a difference. They're improving the systemic milieu. Certainly exercise, diet, improvement of comorbidities also do the same. I like to uh, use this particular uh, post-hoc analysis of the CANTOS uh, trial to illustrate this point. <clears throat> this is um, a trial that many of you are aware of. The hypothesis what the, was that uh, kenicanumab, uh, which is an IL-1 beta monoclonal antibody, would reduce um, cardiovascular outcomes in patients um, that were at particularly high risk. These were patients, some 10,000 patients who had had an MI <clears throat> and an elevated uh, high sensitivity CRP. And as you recall, the outcome <clears throat> um, um, and this was uh, a series of doses um, in the original trial did suggest that um, uh, hard endpoints could be affected by improving the inflammatory milieu without affecting lipids per se. In this subgroup analysis, um, looking at the patients um, for uh, the outcome of heart failure in particular, you can see that there was a graded uh, um, attenuation of heart failure hospitalizations with increasing doses of this uh, monoclonal antibody, suggesting again that targeting the inflammatory milieu may have an impact on uh, preserving renal function and cardiac function <clears throat> that results in heart outcomes such as heart failure hospitalizations. So this was uh, something I mentioned earlier that uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction I think, you know, at the two ends of these poles, I think I, we're all comfortable that they're either being more cardiac driven or renal driven, but those, most of our patients, which are in the middle of this, um, uh, of this scale are the kind of patients that we see in clinical practice. And perhaps the issue is that it's not the renal driving the cardiac or the cardiac driving the renal, it's the environment driving dysfunction of both. And um, perhaps this is the vicious cycle that we get into, that whether you start with impaired renal dysfunction or cardiac dysfunction, the, um, uh, the uh, consequent salt and water retention um, leads to um, an inflammatory, uh, highly oxidant milieu, which of course drives further dysfunction of the other organ, and you, and you get this uh, situation that's amplified in a um, systemic environment where there is diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and aging. So uh, I really think it's um, time to perhaps spend, not spend so much time, frankly, on the cardiac manifestations of FEPF, 
but the systemic manifestations and particularly the kidney because at the end of the day it is congestion for us as clinicians that drive this diagnosis and as we think more systemically about the patient and the impact of um, a disturbed uh, neighborhood on cardiac dysfunction we can I think also appreciate the impact uh, on the kidney. So to summarize the cause of volume overload and HFPEF is not clear. In contrast to HFREF, neurohormonal activation is not universal um, in HFPEF. Um, also, there's a great amount of heterogeneity in the cardiac dysfunction that is seen, but what unifies all these patients is the volume overload. The volume overload does not appear to be driven by cardiac dysfunction per se, implying that there is a primary renal issue at work here. Um, as I illustrated, this is, of course, a vicious cycle situation in a disturbed environment. And then targeting the kidney as well as the environment is now here and a practical solution for our patients and for further investigation. I want to give a quick shout out uh, to my division uh, that allows me the time to come and spend the day uh, in Seattle virtually with you. Um, these are all the kind of people um, that certainly make my life uh, better uh, and help to advance uh, understanding of a multitude of disorders, including HFPEF. I'd invite you all to come to Salt Lake to ski as well, but we've had no snow for three weeks, <laughs> although it's really nice and it's getting warmer. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. That was terrific. A great demonstration of what you're a thought leader in our field. Um, we've been, uh, it's been suggested to me that we should put the, uh, that, uh, put your questions in the uh, chat um, and uh, I'll read them out. Um, so, uh, while the, uh, while uh, those are coming in, uh, Jim, I wonder, that, that was, I mean, that was really fantastic. And um, you've obviously thought about this a lot. So from the standpoint of clinical practice, understanding that a lot of these questions still aren't resolved, what's your recipe for treating HFPEF, <laughs> the, the cardiac and renal dysfunction in HFPEF? How do you approach that? Clinically? Yeah, so I, so I divide the world into people with congestion and no congestion. <laughs> so, you know, once there, there's been clear evidence of congestion, so either a, a heart failure hospitalization or, frankly, an improvement in their symptomatic status in, in the office with the institution of diuretic uh, therapy, I first of all always want to make sure that there is not a, a particular mimicker of HFPEF, uh, and I would call that restrictive cardiomyopathy. I think anytime you see a patient with HFPEF, it's always important to make sure you're not seeing a patient with the purest form of diastolic dysfunction, which is a patient with restrictive cardiomyopathy, whether that's amyloid, whether that's actually a, a burnt out hypertroph, uh, et cetera. I, I think that's really important in the differential diagnosis. Um, again, um, then number two, of course, is, is uh, making sure that you're doing your best to drive comorbidity. So, it's really popular now to talk about monthly disciplinary teams, right, taking care of these patients. I think a lot of these patients we as cardiologists or cardiovascular providers never see because they are uh, cared for by primary care physicians, hospitals, et cetera. Um, but I, as I try to make the case, if you can improve the milieu by improving the comorbidities, I think uh, these patients uh, um, can get better. And then, of course, um, other than managing hypertension, I do think it is important to uh, use three classes of drugs that I tell you I do use. They include spironolactone, because <laughs> it's cheap and I believe the top cat data. Uh, there are other studies, as you know, uh, coming forth. Uh, number two, I consider uh, sacubitril valsartan. Uh, you know, I showed you a slide that showed head-to-head -head versus, you know, empagliflozin. Um, the uh, differences and benefits, um, particularly in patients who are hypertensive, I will often you know, think about sacubitril valsartan. And then finally, uh, sodium glucose cotransporter type 2 inhibitors, uh, I do think that they are uh, very effective uh, in this space. I think the DELIVER trial, I'm one of the uh, national lead investigators, we hope will be 
reporting out um, uh, later this year and to see another confirmatory large-scale trial I think will be very important. Do I refer people for cardiomems? <laughs> uh, I'll just tell you I do not unless it's a patient who's a real frequent flyer. Um, you have to keep in mind cardiomems is not a substitute for compliance. <laughs> so <laughs> a $25,000 device doesn't make people take their medications any better. So uh, I, I'm not a big fan of doing that unless it's, uh, unless it's a frequent flyer that I'm comfortable that they're complying with. So that's a very long-winded answer, but hopefully complete. That's great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, there, There's a question from Christy Hepner. Uh, thank you for uh, the wonderful presentation, Dr. Fang. Uh, you mentioned that the guidelines will be updated in April, and I was curious to get your thoughts about what you think the uh, major and important changes might be. Yeah. Uh, so, as you know, I'm sworn to secrecy because um, <laughs> I'm on the I'm on the guideline committee. So I really can't say a whole lot without me getting into a lot of trouble. So uh, I would only tell you to stay tuned. I guess the only teaser I can give you is that. Um, of course, the ESC beat us. <laughs> Their updated heart failure guidelines came out, as you know, a few months ago. Um, but I think you will see a lot of parallels. I think you will see a lot of parallels. That's probably as much as I can say. Great. That's very helpful. And uh, we don't want you to get in trouble. So, um, let me see uh, in the chat. Uh, let's see. Alex Ta Taylor uh, said, thanks for your wonderful lecture. Um, Anecdotally, uh, I'm going to read it over here. Anecdotally, cost has been a barrier to starting SGLT2 inhibitors for many patients. Any tips or tricks for encouraging insurers to cover these meds? Yeah, great question. I tell you, I spend a lot of time in the office these days talking about how much things are going to cost. It's always a buzzkill for me when a patient says, you know, Dr. Fang, you wrote for something that's going to cost me $500 a month. <laughs> I did not pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> So I have the open conversation even before I write them for the prescription that we may be spending a few weeks or months trying to figure out whether or not we can get this class of drug for the patients uh, without spending an exorbitant amount of out-of-pocket costs. Um, the biggest trick I have, Alex, are our clinical pharmacists. I, I suspect at UW you guys have a team of clinical pharmacists that are very good. We round with clinical pharmacists, not only in the hospital, but they're um, available to us in the outpatient setting. And they are remarkable. They are remarkable um, at finding every loophole, <laughs> uh, every plan uh, to try to get these class of drugs for our patients. So that's basically the biggest trick I use, Alex, is to um, loop in our clinical pharmacists, and they can be very effective. Okay. With a lot of... Thank you, Jim. There are a lot of questions here. So... Uh, let's see. In the Q&A, uh, Richard Chang asked for the paradigm of hef, HEFREF. Some data has shown earlier intervention may abrogate progression of disease to more advanced phenotypes. With hef, HEF, we don't have a clear metric such as EF or global longitudinal strain. Uh, do you think an earlier intervention approach also applies to hef, HEF? If so, how would you identify these patients systematically? Yeah, I know that's a really good question. You know, people have talked about using BNP screening uh, in clinical practice. Um, you know, Richard, the way I would do it, and this is really not our, you know, as cardiologists and particular heart failure doctors who are sub sub specialists, this is really a talk for our primary care colleagues because so much of this is driven by comorbidity that's creating a, you know, systemic inflammation, high oxidant stress environment that leads not only to the cardiac dysfunction, but to the renal dysfunction. So yeah, to go more proximally is, is really the benefit. And I tried to show you some data that supported that. So, you know, for the example, not only uh, controlling hypertension, but using the right drug to control hypertension. Uh, I do think that uh, using a thiazide-based diuretic, and you can even argue using an MRA as a first-line agent to control hypertension, uh, are not uh, unreasonable approaches. Um, certainly in somebody with early diabetes, for example, or glucose intolerance, you could think about using an SGLT2 inhibitor with the idea of not only improving the systemic environment, but specifically trying to prevent progression of renal insufficiency as the final arbiter of congestion. Great, thanks. Uh, so 829 
Maybe one more question from Stephanie Cooper. Uh, wonderful presentation. It would be great to more consistently diagnose hep, hep, hep well before first hospitalization. Uh, what's your go-to method in, uh, in someone with risk factors and shortness of breath and normal resting filling pressures? Yeah, okay, that's another great question. So I don't know if you're a big fan of the H2 PEF score. <laughs> So the H2 PEF score was put forth by uh, um, Barry and his colleagues at Mayo. Uh, this is a, a risk score that includes five characteristics of patients and those patients who are obviously at very high risk. You don't need anything invasive and patients who have very few points on their score, probably you should move on to other diagnoses. Echocardiographically, I look at left atrial enlargement and pulmonary hypertension. If they've got left atrial enlargement and pulmonary hypertension, it's probably FF. Uh, obviously an elevation of natriuretic peptides. My caveat is that when you see a very high natriuretic peptide level in a HEF-PEF patient, make sure that you've thought about amyloid. Amyloid, we believe, affects 10 to 15% of all HEF-PEF patients, particularly if the patient is an older male patient. An older male patient with HEF-PEF and a very high BMP, it, that's amyloid until proven otherwise. Thank you. Um, well, thanks, uh, Jim. That that was really amazing, and uh, uh, we're really glad that you agreed to give this talk. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge again uh, Werner and Joan uh, Sampson uh, for funding this lectureship. Uh, Werner was a, a valued colleague at the University of Washington here for uh, probably about sixty years or so, uh, and was the assistant dean of. Uh, of uh, for admissions uh, for the medical school for many years, uh, including uh, uh, making major contributions to the medical one and medic two programs. Thank you, Jim. Talk to you later. <laughs>